The Supreme Discovery by the Mother Part 1 One of the most beautiful and cherished moments in my early years was finding the supreme discovery by mother. It had such a great impact on my life in those formative times that I wanted to share with everyone. The Supreme Discovery If we want to progress integrally, we must build within our conscious being a strong and pure mental synthesis which can serve us as a protection against temptations from outside, as a landmark to prevent us from going astray, as a beacon to light our way across the moving ocean of life. Each individual should build up this mental synthesis according to his own tendencies and affinities and aspirations. But if we want it to be truly living and luminous, it must be centered on the idea that is the intellectual representation symbolizing that which is at the center of our being, that which is our life and our light. This idea expressed in sublime words has been taught in various forms by all the great instructors in all lands and all ages. The self of each one and the great universal self are one, since all that is exists from all eternity in its essence and principle. Why make a distinction between the being and its origin, between ourselves and what we place at the beginning. The ancient traditions rightly said, our origin and ourselves, our God and ourselves are one. And this oneness should not be understood merely as a more or less close and intimate relationship of union, but as a true identity. Thus, when a man who seeks the divine attempts to reascend by degrees towards the inaccessible, he forgets that all his knowledge and all his intuition cannot take him one step forward in this infinite. Neither does he know that what he wants to attain, what he believes to be so far from him, is within him. For how could he know anything of the origin until he becomes conscious of the origin in himself? It is by understanding himself, by learning to know himself, that he can make the supreme discovery and cry out in wonder, like the patriarch in the Bible, the house of God is here, and I knew it not. That is why we must express that sublime thought, creatrix of the material worlds, and make known to all the word that fills the heavens and the earth. I am in all things and all beings. When all shall know this, 
the promised day of great transfigurations will be at hand, when in each atom of matter men shall recognize the indwelling thought of God, when in each living creature they shall perceive some hint of a gesture of God, when each man can see God in his brother, then dawn will break, dispelling the darkness, the falsehood, the ignorance, the error and suffering that weigh upon all nature. For all nature suffers and laments as she awaits the revelation of the sons of God. This, indeed, is the central thought epitomizing all others, the thought which should be ever present to our remembrance as the sun that illumines all life. That is why I remind you of it today. For if we follow our path, bearing this thought in our hearts like the rarest jewel, the most precious treasure, if we allow it to do its work of illumination and transfiguration within us, we shall know that it lives in the center of all beings and all things, and in it we shall feel the marvelous oneness of the universe. Then we shall understand the vanity and childishness of our meager satisfactions, our foolish quarrels, our petty passions, our blind indignations. We shall see the dissolution of our little faults, the crumbling of the last entrenchments of our limited personality and our obtuse egoism. We shall feel ourselves being swept along by this sublime current of true spirituality which will deliver us from our narrow limits and bounds. The individual self and the universal self are one. In every world, in every being, in everything, in every atom is the divine presence. And man's mission is to manifest it. In order to do that, he must become conscious of this divine presence within him. Some individuals must undergo a real apprenticeship in order to achieve this. Their egoistic being is too all-absorbing, too rigid, too conservative, and their struggles against it are long and painful. Others, on the contrary, who are more impersonal, more plastic, more spiritualized, come easily into contact with the inexhaustible divine source of their being. But let us not forget that they too should devote themselves daily, constantly, to a methodical effort of adaptation and transformation, so that nothing within them may ever again obscure the radiance of that pure light. But how greatly the standpoint changes once we attain this deeper consciousness, how understanding widens, how compassion grows. On this, a sage has said, quote, 
I would like each one of us to come to the point where he perceives the inner God who dwells even in the vilest of human beings. Instead of condemning him, we would say, Arise, O resplendent being, thou who art ever pure, who knowest neither birth nor death. Arise, Almighty One, and manifest thy nature. Let us live by this beautiful utterance, and we shall see everything around us transformed as if by miracle. This is the attitude of true, conscious, and discerning love, the love which knows how to see behind appearances, understand in spite of words, and which, amid all obstacles, is in constant communion with the depths. What value have our impulses and our desires, our anguish and our violence, our sufferings and our struggles, all these inner vicissitudes unduly dramatized by our unruly imagination? What value do they have before this great, this sublime and divine love bending over us from the innermost depths of our being, bearing with our weaknesses, rectifying our errors, healing our wounds, bathing our whole being with its regenerating streams. For the inner Godhead never imposes herself. She neither demands nor threatens. She offers and gives herself, conceals and forgets herself in the heart of all beings and things. She never accuses. She neither judges nor curses nor condemns, but works unceasingly to perfect without constraint to mend without reproach, to encourage without impatience, to enrich each one with all the wealth he can receive. She is the mother whose love bears fruit and nourishes, guards and protects, counsels and consoles because she understands everything. She can endure everything, excuse and pardon everything, hope and prepare for everything, bearing everything within herself. She owns nothing that does not belong to all. And because she reigns over all, she is the servant of all. That is why all, great and small, who want to be kings with her and gods in her, become like her, not despots, but servitors among their brethren.